All right. Started the recording. Um, thanks for joining. Thanks for registering and coming along to this next in our series of webinars, so Managing Poor Performance and Conduct. Sadly, almost sadly, we've had a really good response to this particular webinar, which, uh, and I say sadly because that's a bit of an indication that um, that we've got more businesses facing or needing to face this um, this particular situation, and it is one of those things that we that we unfortunately need to deal with sometimes in business, and and it can be frustrating and it can be stressful and and honestly I think can be quite scary um, when we are in that process of poor performance or conduct and and potentially you know even having to let people go and I think that can sometimes be the hardest decision or the hardest thing that we have to to do um, and so you know obviously is a topic that is really quite interesting for managers and business owners in terms of how to get it right so really appreciate you joining us today. Um, so I'm Naomi, for those who don't know me, I started Focus HR about 11 years ago now. Um, and yeah, we do people leadership and strategy consulting for mainly small to medium businesses. Um, we're co-presenting today. We've got my colleague, Jessica Passfield on as well. Hey, Jess. Hi, all. Um, so we're going to have her um, presenting a part of this as well. We'll sort of tic-tac as we go through um, we do like these to be interactive where possible. We've got a bunch of information and, and processes that we're going to share with you. Um, so we will keep pushing through. We do ask that people are on mute during it just so that there's no sort of echo or feedback as we go. But um, if you do have questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat function. Um, Jess and I will keep an eye on that. And if, if anything pops up that, um, that we can answer straight away, we will. Um, but yeah, basically, we're going to go through in the next hour and hand you a whole bunch of information. Um, so let's kick into it. Um, my first thing I want to share with you, and this thing, this video is really old, but it tickles me every single time I see it. Let's see if it'll play for us. When we asked Reebok to send us Terry Tate, some people thought we were crazy. But I'm a firm believer in paradigm breaking, outside the box thinking. Hey, buddy. Break was over 15 minutes ago, Mitch! And since Terry's been with us, our productivity has gone up 46%. <laughs> We're getting more from our employees than ever before. You know you need a cover sheet on your TPS reports, Richard! That ain't new, baby! Hey, Terry. Hey, Janice! My but what's really impressed me is how Terry's become part of the Felcher family. He fits right in here. That's a low distance call, Doug! To be honest, I wish Reebok sent us 10 Terry Tates. You wanna play game stream? Well, when it's game time, it's pay time, baby! I don't know about you, but that just makes me giggle. And it's it's funny when we talk to um, particularly sort of the, you know, the older generation of business owners, it is amazing the amount of times they say to us, ah, oh, when we used to be able to take them out the back and give them a serve, you know, it's that kind of um, almost what you sometimes feel like doing, even though you can't, um, it, definitely the good old days. Um, I know the quality of that video is a little bit, grainy but if you look it up on YouTube if you look up Terry Tate there's a whole bunch of his stuff on there it's really quite humorous so um I just guess before we get into um the how uh the the concept we want to sort of cover a bit of the basics Jess is this where you're taking over from me you're just on mute still sorry um, yeah, so before we get into the nitty gritty, um, we just want to get a clear understanding of what underperformance is exactly. So I don't know. I can't click, can I, Nay? Oh, cool. Thank you. If you want to go to the next one, that'd be great. Um, so when we're looking at at what poor performance is, the Fair Work Ombudsman states very clearly that underperformance 
or poor performance can be exhibited in the following ways. So if you look at them in order, the first one's unsatisfactory work performance. So that is a failure to perform the duties of the position or to perform them to the standard required, to, to the standard required. It may be that they don't have the skills or abilities to complete the task, or they have the ability, but due to poor attitude, choose not to do what is required. The second one um, that we look at is non-compliance with the workplace policies, rules or procedures. For example, completing a purchase order and not entering the correct or required data or providing incorrect information to clients or not following what they are assigned to do each day. Number three, unacceptable behaviour in the workplace. This can be defined as behaviour that creates or has the potential to create the risk the, a risk to the business or the health and safety of its employees. It can, it can also include bullying and harassment. And finally, number four, disruptive and negative or negative behaviour that impacts on co-workers. This could be making rude, condescend, condescending, insulting or demanding statements to others or using hostile tones. This isn't an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of what sort of things may apply. Um, and we just want to touch on one final point. Underperformance is not the same as misconduct. Misconduct is very serious behaviour such as theft or assault, which may warrant instant dismissal. In cases of misconduct, employers should seek specific advice about how to proceed before taking any action on these. So why does it happen? I've lost count on how many times I have shaken my head due to the fact that someone has done something that warrants a performance discussion. Sometimes you go, seriously, is this for real? Am I really having to deal with this? And I get that it can be really frustrating because most of what you are probably think, most of you are probably thinking, I have far better things to do than to be dealing with this person. The reality though, is that humans are complex creatures and there is never just one reason why people behave, perform or behave poorly. And it's really important to understand the cause and the why and the why to what they are doing, because that is often the key to fixing the issue. There are some common reasons that I want to share with you today, and I think they can easily sit in two different categories. There are workplace factors and personal factors. Let's have a look at the differences with these. Um, so first, let's touch on workplace factors. Unclear or not set expectations. So an employee doesn't know what is expected because goals and or standards of the workplace have not been, um, and sorry, workplace policies and consequences have not been clear or have not been set. Mismatch capabilities. There is a mismatch between an employee's capability and the job that they're required to do, or the employee does not have the knowledge or skills to do the job expected of them. Poor culture, bad or bad working environment. If the general vibe in the office is negative and highly pressured, then this can have a negative effect on the employee's ability to cope with the team. Lack of communication. An employee does not know whether they are doing a good job because there is no counselling or feedback on their performance. Workplace bullying. Where this is occurring, it tends to have a serious impact on performance and sometimes results in reciprocal poor conduct and lack of initiatives. It's a great feeling when you go above and beyond to achieve your targets, but if there's no incentive for you to achieve these, this can cause employees to feel unobligated or unmotivated to achieve more in their role. Now let's have a look at the personal factors that may, we may need to consider. Interpersonal differences. Some people just don't get on well with some people and this can manifest itself in poor performance or conduct when it's not managed properly. Personal issues such as family stress, physical and or mental health problems or problems with drugs and alcohol or lack of personal motivation. For various reasons, a person may be lacking the internal motivation or drive to perform at the level needed. Understanding um, that it can be either workplace or personal will also allow you to determine if it is something that you can fix and to what degree you can influence the solution. For example, if it is because of unclear expectations, then that is easier for you to influence the fix than a family personal issue. Or if it is a lack of communication, then that is far easier to fix and lack of personal motivation. We'll now look at the performance management cycle. So effective performance management from employees perspective is all about knowing what the expectations are at any point in time and whether or not they are meeting those. It needs to be applied through the complete cycle of employment. Starting with hiring. 
Managing the performance of an employee starts at day dot during the recruitment. Are you clear in the advert what experience and qualifications you are wanting? During interviewing, do you use set questions that search out whether the person is competent to do their role? And more importantly, do you take the opportunity to explain to the candidate what you'll be expected of them if they are successful? You also need to consider, do you have a professional position description to give the, the candidate so that it is very clear what is required they are required to do, um, including adding in plus reasonable additional duties as instructed? And do you exercise the full extent of your search warrant to reference checks and making sure they have common sense as well? Next is probation. This time allows you to formalise the expectations. You need to make sure that you have proper induction and training plan that sets these expectations. Set them, make sure you give them all the information to be able to meet them and then measure them. If someone cannot keep it together and try to impress you during this probationary period, they're not going to continue to do this once the honeymoon is over. That is not to say that they have to be able to do the role within this time, but they need to be able to demonstrate the behaviours and commitment to trying, to trying, which will tell you that they are able to perform in the long term. Next is performance appraisals. Performance appraisals allow both parties to discuss and, and realign or redefine the expectations as needed. Performance reviews generally scare a lot of people, but they don't need to be scary. When you, have, when you look at having a performance appraisal tool for your business, use common sense and stick to it. Do not make a huge complicated tool with tags, add-ons, 10 pages of content, five pages of explanation, a psychological profile and a game of volleyball all built into one and at, at one amazing annual event that no one wants to be invited to. Make sure the tool is simple and allows a conversation that is two-way but can address tricky areas as needed. And finally, counselling and discipline. Counselling is a less formal conversational approach to dealing with issues before the, they become major. Discipline is a more formal interview and documentation approach to dealing with more serious or ongoing issues. It is important to ensure that counselling conversations are happening as soon as the issue arises. As this hopefully works towards preventing the need to move to a more formal approach on, of discipline. No matter the approach, always take notes and document these conversations on the employee's file. So if and when a situation escalates, the notes and evidence are easily accessed. And then moving on. Jess, I, yes. I really like um, the points that you make there. And I just, I wanted to flag, I feel like that sort of one through to three, they're all the kind of really good common sense preventative things as in, you know, if, if we don't set expectations during hiring, if we don't reinforce them and check on them during probation, and, and if we're not having a regular feedback mechanism of some sort, that's when little things can grow to big things and we end up really having to, you know, throw the book at people from the point of view of um, needing to be, you know, a bit more formal around that managing poor performance and conduct, which is obviously what we're going to get into. But um, you know, my my argument is almost you do those first three well and hopefully you avoid ever having to get into the really serious end of town. Yep. Sorry, this is my two cents. No, no that's okay. Need, need your two cents. <laughs> so this section um, that we're going to go into provides the processes, tools and tips to guide you in the performance, conduct and management of your people. It obviously cannot cover every scenario or circumstance that you may face as a manager. However, it should give you the adequate guidance and direction direction and assistance needed to equip you with the knowledge to make the right decisions when managing performance and conduct. If in doubt, always ask your manager or Focus HR for guidance and clarity. This section is targeted at assisting in the process of managing poor, poor or underperformance and poor conduct. Importantly, it applies to the um, it applies to managing performance and conduct once the employee is outside of their probation or qualifying period. You can still apply the principles and tools within this time, but remember that the same standard of process isn't required. So looking at our approach, we believe that people are given clear expectations and the encouragement and means to meet those. Oh, sorry, that when people are given clear expectations, they'll be inherently driven to perform and act to a satisfactory level. Performance improvement and management should be approached with this in mind, as the manager's mindset is a key piece in the success of the process. So before we start any processes, we need to ask questions that will help you identify the correct course of action to take. One, can we reasonably expect the employee to have known better? 
For example, was the employee told, instructed, educated through their contract policies or training? Can we presume the employee should be competent or aware of the expectations mm -hmm. based on their experience, skills or qualifications? And have we previously given the employee feedback, guidance or counselling about this? If yes, consider starting at the performance improvement plans. If no, start the alignment and clarity, including looking at training needs. Number two, how serious is the performance and co or conduct issue? Was anyone, anything or the business placed in significant risk? Is there a direct breach of policy procedures or agreement? And does it fall under the definition of serious misconduct or grounds of for summary dismissal? If yes, consider starting at the formal performance management and discuss with management or your HR advisor as a more serious course of action may be required here. If no, start with alignment and clarity or performance improvement plans. Number three, what have we done with previous employees who do it, did a similar thing? This, the purpose of considering this is making sure that the chosen course of action is consistent with similar issues that you have faced in the business previously. And four, what is the employee's history or, or performance with you? Are they a long-standing employee with solid performance and conduct, conduct record? If yes, start with the alignment and clarity, including discussing why they have changed. If no, start with either alignment and clarity or performance improvement plans. Jess, yes. sorry, I think it's important to note with this, these questions, these are sorts of things that when businesses ring us and say, hey, this is the issue, you know, what do we do next? These are the kinds of things we run through in our heads, right? From a, from a HR perspective. And the reason why they're so important is that this is the background thinking that ensures a fair, thorough process. And we know that if this ends up in fair work, if it results in dismissal and we end up in fair work with an unfair dismissal claim, these are the sorts of considerations that you need to be able to show that you've had along the way. So um, the reason why we flag these questions is that, you know, when you're starting that process and starting to think that you might need to go down the path of a bit more formal performance management, this helps you make sure that you take the right first step and then the right next step, rather than risking jumping in at, you know, final warning or dismissal or, or taking action that doesn't match the situation. Yep, but just a bit of protection almost <laughs> um, for potential outcomes. Yep. Um, so the Focus HR approach to performance conduct and performance and conduct improvement and management process has three main phases. Number one is alignment and clarity, which is used for the early stages where there may be minor behavioural concerns or initial signs of unsatisfactory performance. Number two is performance improvement plans. This is used where the behaviour behavior or performance concerns are more serious, detailed, or where al initial alignment and clarity conversations have not resulted in any improvement. And finally, formal performance management. This is used for significant incidences, instances or performance behaviour concerns or where the performance improvement plan has not resulted in improvement. The process is not necessarily linear and an issue may warrant starting at the performance improvement plan stage or even the formal performance management stage. Or it may start at the performance improvement plan and downgrade to alignment and clarity discussions once expectations have been met and you are maintaining your monitoring. The process may also stop at any point where the performance or conduct is improved or may progress through to termination of employment. And now I'll pass back to Nay. Cool. Thanks, Jess. Right. This, this approach and the terminology that you'll see here, this is the Focus HR way of looking at it. Um, you know, so a lot of people are more familiar with the concept of counselling, formal warnings, termination. We take the approach of the counselling is actually about ensuring that alignment and clarity. So this is the almost the preventative stuff. The performance management in the middle, we really want that intent or the focus on performance improvement because we've got to keep in mind, I think, you know, Jess made the point right at the start around the intent being one of the key things. Our intent throughout this process should be that the employee gets on track, becomes a great employee, performs and conducts at the right level. That's our intent. Um, and so our terminology around this, I believe, needs to reflect that. Um, you know, and so it's not until we've sort of gone through those bits that we may end up in that formal performance management. 
Um, and the point that Jess made around it's not linear is really, really important. Those questions that, that we just went through earlier, they will help you to identify, are we having an alignment and clarity conversation or are we jumping straight to formal performance management? Because it is situation by situation will determine what you're going to do. So I want to dive in on a little bit more detail around some of these processes so you get to see what we see as being a part of each of these elements. So the alignment and clarity conversation essentially is a meeting. So we're having a, a discussion with the employee. It's still relatively informal at this stage, remember, so it's not a a big formal meeting with numerous people involved, but we're having a meeting, a, a discussion with um, the employee where we're talking about, you know, what are we seeing in terms of their behavioural performance? What are our concerns on that? Um, you know, and clarifying for the employee what your expectations were, what's your concern? Why is that a concern? The why is a really important piece and how it impacts on the workplace. So it's a really brief sort of an outline of um, what you're seeing and why you're needing to raise something with them. You want to clarify, and this is the intent piece around what outcome you want to achieve. So you need to be really uh, conscious with your wording around, you know, what I what my intent in having this conversation with you is to, you know, bring you up to speed with what the expectations are or to make sure that you know you're behaving in a way that's consistent with our team culture it's a very positively worded way of looking at our intent is to bring you back into line um, we always throughout this whole process want this to be a two-way conversation so anytime we're discussing this stuff we are asking the employee for their thoughts so what do you you know what are your thoughts on those expectations or do you think you can achieve them or is there a reason why you know you might not be meeting that performance level at the moment or why you're behaving in the way that you are at the moment always asking them questions to get their input and then we're working on that jointly devising a solution or a plan of approach this part for me is so so important if we can get the employee engaging around how do we fix this or how, you know, what's the change that we need to see and how do we achieve that, we're going to have far more buy-in from them on actually doing it. If we just dictate to them, this is the change we need or this is the fix, you decrease the chances of success just because it's like everything in life, right? If we're a part of the solution, if we're part of that discussion and, and feel like we've got ownership of what the outcome is, we're far more likely to actually implement it than if someone just tells us what to do. It's kind of human nature. So, so we want to jointly devise those, um, the plan of what to do. Um, and then we want to make sure that we follow up. So, um, you know, we're doing the touch base depending on what it is that you're talking about it might be a you know reminder to yourself to follow up in a week or two weeks or whatever it happens to be but the follow-up is just so important so many times we have these conversations and then we forget to revisit it and when we do that one of two things happens one is the employee hasn't made the change that we need but because we don't follow up they go oh it's not actually all that important anyway I'm right and it becomes a bigger problem or two they do make the change that we want them to make but then we're not giving them any positive reinforcement around that and it's so important that if someone responds really well to feedback that we give them the hey really I can see that you've made this effort really appreciate it and it can be as simple and as short as that because remember really informal at this stage so our alignment and clarity conversations it's typically one-on-one -on -one with the employee, you know, manager and employee, you don't have to have other people in the room. This is not formal disciplinary proceedings yet, which also means the employee doesn't need to have a support person present. Um, I have a bit of an approach though, where if an employee asks to have a support person present, um, I'm normally pretty hesitant to say no. Having said that, if it's genuinely a really brief conversation, I'd be saying to them, look, you really don't need to, if you want to go for it, but this is just you and I having a chat. Um, you also don't need to give a ton of notice that you're going to have this chat either. I find quite often these conversations, 
either happen on the fly or it might be a, um, you know, tapping them on the shoulder and saying, hey, after lunch, can you pop into me? I just want to have a quick chat with you. Really informal still. The only thing I do recommend in terms of the formalities of it is keep a record of the fact that you've had the conversation. That can be in any way you like. It can be a diary note in your hard copy folder. It can be um, a, a note that goes into your employee file in your system. It can be an email to your manager or an email to HR, but in some way, shape or form capture the fact that you've had the conversation, what the expectations that were set, what was the action plan that was agreed to, these notes form the basis of, again, I hate doing this whole worst case scenario, but they are so important when you're wanting to show a strong history of dealing with this in the right way, if we end up at the pointy end of a, a termination. So next stage from that, as Jess pointed out, is that performance improvement plan or PIP it's often called. Um, so we use this, it's a tool that drives performance. So it's kind of the next stage or sometimes the first stage when we're looking at, we need to be a little bit more formal around an employee not performing to the right level or not conducting themselves in the right way. Um, and there's a really nice framework or a template that we use that helps managers and employees to talk through, you know, what are the issues? What are the expectations? What are we agreeing on? Um, and really very much a similar process to when you are doing the alignment and clarity conversations. You'll see the theme of how we have these meetings or discussions remains pretty consistent right until the end because it, it's always that concept of let's talk about what we're seeing. Why is it a concern? What's the change we need to see? Let's come up with a plan on how to make that change who's going to do what, you, that's a rolling process. It just gets a little bit more serious and a little bit more formal each time. Um, so again, your session with this is very much a face-to-face -face meeting with the employee. It's not something that you just hand to them. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, so the essential parts that we see of a performance improvement plan is you want to have a definite time frame and checkpoints for progress. So this is where you're getting a little bit more clear on what are you going to achieve by when and how are we doing it? We want those really clear goals. Um, we are looking at, is there any training that we need to give you to be able to achieve the level that we're asking for? We may need to set regular meetings in place. So Sometimes, depending on the change that you're looking for, it may well be that this is a two-month plan or a six-month plan. <coughs> it may also be an instant thing as in, um, you know, if you're meeting with them to talk about being um, late to work regularly, that's a pretty instant change that we're looking for. Um, but otherwise, you're setting that plan for when are we checking in. Um, and then you are documenting. And I'm just going to let you have a look at the next slide while I put myself on mute and have a proper cough. But this is, a, this is the um, idea on how we document it. So this is the template we use and you can see up the top we've got the headings and then the red is just an example of what that might look like when you are after you've had the meeting or when you're having the meeting and are filling this sort of stuff out. So we've got the what's the area of concern, specifically what's been happening, a couple of examples, um, you know, what's the standard that we want to set for you, this is where we're agreeing to, so that jointly devised action plan. And then we're detailing what support the employee needs. Because remember, this is a two-way street as well. So the employee might say, you know, yep, I can commit to doing that, but I do need retraining in X, Y, Z, or um, I'm finding that, you know, my internet is so slow that I just can't, you know, it seems to spool and that's affecting the speed at which I can do it. Whatever it happens to be. If there's elements that you need to sort of take care of as a manager, you're listing those in the support element. Then you're setting one of the review points or point 
And then there's a space there, obviously, for notes to be taken because this document then gets pulled out at the review point. And you're looking at, right, what did we agree to do? And you're making notes on how are we tracking? How are we actually going? Um, Kerry, copy of the um, copy of the docs. Yeah, we're going to do an offer at the end. You'll see um, we've got a package that we've put together for you. So, and we, you will get um, a copy of the slides as well. You can see down the bottom that we've got the employee's input. So any reasons for or thoughts about lack of performance conduct. So in that meeting, when you are asking the employee around, you know, have can you talk to us, you know, give us some insight on why this might be happening. You're making notes down there as to what they're saying as well. So it's just a really nice, simple, but comprehensive way to capture what that performance improvement plan is. And we've just given one line there, that red line, but the actual document ends up with a number of lines because each time you meet, you'll have another, um, another sort of date put in and then what's the next topic that you talk about until the improvement level is achieved and you get to celebrate that and you get to sort of put this away and file it or it moves to the next level. So if it goes to the next level, then we might be sitting at formal or final warning style approach. Um, and we do, sometimes you jump straight to this if it's serious enough, but we do recommend you've gone through the PIP process otherwise. Um, so this starts to be more formal. So we want to call the meeting with the employee. And ideally, you're starting to do this now in writing. Um, could be a letter could be an email, um, it doesn't need to be a big formal letter, but we are giving them notice to say, we wanna meet with you and it's about this performance concern or conduct concern. They're normally aware of it by now, unless you're sort of jumping straight into formal or final warning. If they've been through the PIT process, they know what's going on. And we're saying, hey, we're, we're hitting the next stage. We need to have a more formal meeting. From your perspective as the business manager or owner, it should be yourself and one other. So this is the point when you want two business representatives in the room. Could be HR, could be another supervisor or manager. Um, and the employee is offered the opportunity to have a support person present. The reason we want you to have another person present is that um, the, the ability to have a witness um, and also, these conversations aren't easy. Like, they, it, gosh, you know, I've been doing this HR gig for 22 years um, and I guarantee you I still walk into any of these sorts of sessions um, kind of going, oh, gosh, please get this right, please get this right. You know, they're, they're not easy to do. You want your full focus on engaging with the person sitting in front of you getting the right outcome, listening to what they've got to say, asking the right questions. Your second person then is a the person that can take notes so that you're not worried about doing two at the same time. Um, and then in terms of the when, when we're hitting this point, we do recommend giving at least sort of 24 hours notice of the meeting um, so that they know it's happening, they can organise a support person to, to come along, et cetera. If you're also asking them to put together any information before they come in, think about whether or not that's realistic or if they need a little bit longer. This is the crappy part in my mind, right? Fair Work actually, their guidelines do require us to give some notice when we're having these formal meetings. The part that I really hate is that of course, that's 24 hours of stress for that individual. Um, I'm yet to come up with a way around that because the flip side of it is, you know, if you just pull them straight into a meeting, you blindside them. So it's kind of a, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. But what it means to me is the way that we notify them that we're going to have a meeting is really important to get that wording right. Um, and that we're, you can't sort of sugarcoat it or make it really unclear, but I think it's important that we word that really well to say, you know, we want to have a, a meeting about, um, about some concerns. The intent of this meeting is to, 
you know, come up with a plan, you know, listen to your input, et cetera. We want to get that really right. So in the meeting, we're referring to that written thing, you know, the, however we've emailed them or given them the letter to, to say, this is what we want to talk about. So, um, and we also are outlining, this is where we start to sort of show the employee that, you know, hey, we've done a few steps. So what have we raised to date? You know, what process have we been following to date if we've been going through the PIP process? What expectations have we set? And then where are those expectations not being met? Again, we want to make sure that we are clear on the intent of the meeting being opportunity for you to respond as to why these concerns still exist and come up with a plan on how we fix this. You'd be working through that PIP to, to do part of that reset those final expectations and timeframes. We're checking, is there anything be outside of work? Is there anything that we need to know about that is impacting on your ability to meet our expectations? You know, now is the time for you to tell us whether anything else is going on so that at least we can take that into account and consider it. In this meeting, really important to note that we are not yet, even though we're thinking about formal final warnings, in this meeting, we have not yet reached that decision. It is a possible outcome. And that's why we're asking for, in particular, is there anything outside of your control? Is there anything outside of work? Anything like that? Because we cannot go into this meeting with our formal warning letter already written. What that says is it doesn't matter what you tell me in this meeting, I'm still going to give you a formal warning or a final warning. So we've got to genuinely be open to the employee's feedback. At the end of the meeting, we will say to them, I'm going to take all of this into account. I'm going to have a think about um, what the appropriate next step is, and then I'll let you know in writing. If that means you need to move to a formal warning or a final warning, that tends to be in writing, then you draft that letter up and provide it to them to let them know. Again, in my experience, these processes aren't pleasant. Sometimes, though, it takes a formal or a final warning for an employee to go, oh, hang on, they're actually serious about this and there's a risk that I could lose my job. And then they pull up their socks sometimes. But do not walk into that meeting with the, the letter already written. So, again, like all the others, we're capturing the outcome of the meeting and then we're going to confirm in writing afterwards and we're going to monitor and follow up. So we're still using that PIP document in this process as well alongside the formal written or final warning, if that's what you do. If there's no, um, if there's no improvement, we may end up sitting at that show cause process. Now keep in mind, there are different levels of expectation from fair work in terms of process that exist for small businesses so 15 under 15 headcount employees and larger businesses um, if you've got any doubt about your process or you're thinking right I just want to be 100% sure then show cause is the way to go and for larger businesses fair work tends to have an expectation that you would go through a show cause process so what the show cause process is is you're essentially giving the employee something in writing um, to say, um, these are our issues. This is what we've done to date. Um, we're now at the pointy end of the stick. We need you to respond to say, is there any reason why we shouldn't terminate your employment? That's essentially the question that we're asking. Now you get to choose when you do this as to whether you want to issue that in writing and ask that they respond in writing or issue that in writing and say, we're going to meet in two days time or one day's time for you to respond to it. Um, circumstances will dictate which way you go with that, but it doesn't have to be a meeting. If you do that final meeting, you're referring very briefly to the letter and then you're quickly handing over to the employee. So, right, we're meeting to talk about this particular letter. Um, you know, I'm now opening the floor for you to give me your response to it um, because really this, this meeting is no longer about pulling it apart or analysing it or coming up with an action plan. We've done all of that. We've stepped through that process. We're now at the stage of the employee being able to tell us if there's any final things that they want to put on the table. And then we do listen to what they've got to say. 
if there's no unexpected topics raised or no other explanation given, um, then you might be able to say to the employee, look, unfortunately, we're at the point where we do need to terminate your um, employment. We'll, set, we'll provide you with a letter for that and talk about notice period. Do they work it? Are you paying it in lieu, et cetera? If they give you an unexpected response, and sometimes this does happen, then you may need to get take some time to consider it and say, I'll, I'll think about that. I'm going to come back to you later on today or tomorrow and let you know where things are up to. Again, really important, you do not walk into this meeting with a termination letter already written. You need to be still genuinely open to listening to the employee's additional explanation or input. It is really rare that an employee will come up with something um, that genuinely changes the course of action at this point in time. Because if you've done the process right, they've had numerous opportunities to raise anything along the way. So really rare, but it does happen. You know, every so often you'll have an employee who says, look, I'm so embarrassed. I didn't want to raise it earlier, but I don't know. And, you know, they'll come up with something in their personal life or they will say, look, I was really scared to, to raise it before now, but I really can't afford to lose my job. Um, you know, I am being sexually harassed by x and that's what's created like sometimes stuff will come up if that is the case like I said you're putting it on pause and saying I'll have a think about it and come back to you sometimes they'll throw stuff at you as well where they'll go well actually I didn't want to say it before now but it's because um you know again they'll come up with a personal thing sometimes you know um I've seen it where someone will say it's because um I suffer from anxiety or um, I've just found out I'm pregnant, you know, again, pause, have a think about it. But just because they give you a final explanation doesn't mean it's actually changes the outcome because quite often you'll look at it and you go, well, that doesn't explain the last three months worth of issues that we have faced. And actually we've still done everything reasonable to try and manage the situation. But honestly, by this stage, really, really recommend that you're getting advice. So get advice from your internal HR person, ring us, ring an IR lawyer, you know, but get some good advice to make sure that you're in a solid position to terminate. So a couple of meeting tips for any of these sorts of meetings, and I've kind of talked a bit about them as we've gone, but very much an open discussion. We are really interested in getting the employee to talk we want their input because when they open up when they get to be when they give us explanations and when they are part of um, the solution we've got a far better chance of a positive outcome here make sure we're balanced in our feedback so you know we're obviously having these discussions for a reason but particularly in the early stages, we also want to make sure that we are as balanced as possible so that we're, we're building them up with the good stuff and letting them know where to improve. So I'm not a fan of the feedback sandwich, mind you, but if there's the opportunity to do things like, um, you know, if someone is having an issue with um, their phone manner and that's what you need to chat to them about, you might say to them, um, you know, look, where I, you know, I get to observe you face to face with our customers every day and you are delightful. They, they can really see that you want to work with them and you're so very helpful. It doesn't translate when you're on the phone though, which is really odd. Here's how you come across when you're on the phone. So we're, we're giving a really balanced approach and trying to help them to play off of their positives as well or their strengths. Location and setting is important. Think about, you know, can, can the conversation be held privately? You know, these kind of conversations are not to be done around other employees or in front of customers, et cetera. And also are we in, environment, in an environment that allows us to have them in an undistracted, uh, undistracted, uninterrupted or undistracted, there's a new word, um, combining the two, you know, so you want to be away from phones, you want your mobile phone on silent or switched off. You want to make sure that you are dedicating your attention to that person. Um, so location and setting, really, really important. It's also important to remember that you want to talk about the issue and not the person. So when we're discussing these things, we're not making it personal. You know, if, they're, if they are, if you're finding that they are unreliable 
Um, so they're not attending work on time or they're, you know, um, calling in sick often. You're not making it, hey, I need to talk to you about the fact that I think you're really lazy and uncommitted. You know, that's a personal attack versus, um, you know, I've, at the moment there's an issue with your attendance, your reliability at work. You know, there's been a number of times in the last week where you've been late and there was also a day when you were sick and you didn't ring to let us know we had to chase you up. You're dealing with the issue. It's not a personal attack. If you make it a personal attack, you raise their hackles and, you, and it means that they're going to be far more defensive, which means we don't get to a solution. And we want to make sure that we are exploring reasons and clarifying. So again, it's their input, but also we're clarifying any details that they do give us so that we are really understanding of where they are at. We're focused on um, our intent to reach improvement. So we keep bringing it back to that original intent of how do we get you to the point we need you to be? How do we improve your performance? How do we get conduct where we need it to be? It's people, it's interesting when you're having these sorts of conversations, one of the really important things people need to hear is, I really want you, um, I, I want to keep you, I want you to stay. I'd love to get you to the point where you're one of our top performers. They want to hear that that's the intent because you've got to remember too, a lot of the times people will have baggage from previous workplaces. So they might have had these sorts of conversations in the past. Um, they've not been held well. It's ended in termination, all those sorts of things. So they will have some fears and some worries around where this is heading, which, which puts up their walls and their barriers and their defensiveness. Whereas if you're really clear around, hey, my intent in talking to you is to, um, you know, improve you, develop you, support you, it can help to break those down. And we want to make really sure that they understand, um, which is, again, why it's so important to have that two-way discussion. But we don't want them to walk out of there going, I'm really not clear on what you're asking me to do or how I'm going to do it. Because obviously they can't do it if they're not clear. So. Um, the last thing I want to cover off on, we, um, having done this for so long with our clients, we know um, frequently asked questions that we tend to get. So I thought I'd share them with you. So one of our first ones is when is a support person involved and what is their purpose? We get asked this all the time. So technically speaking, a support person, an employee has the right to have a support person if it is a meeting that may ultimately lead to dismissal. So that's why we say when you're talking about alignment and clarity conversations, really early days stuff, and actually you're just giving them some guidance. So we don't see that as being um, any kind of indication at that point in time that this may lead to termination. Whereas when we start to head into PIPs and formal and final warning meetings, that is absolutely the point in time when they've got the right to a support person. Our recommendation is um, have a policy that covers how we do performance management that's not too prescriptive, but in that policy, you make it clear that the employee's got the right to have a support person. That covers your basis around having communicated to an employee that they've got the right. You don't necessarily then have to tell them at each stage you've got the right to a support person. It's good practice too, but you don't have to. But if they do ask to have a support person present, don't deny that. When they have a support person there, the purpose of that person is clearly defined by the word support. That person is there to provide moral support um, and, and almost emotional support to the employee. They are not their advocate. They are not their representative. They're not their spokesperson. And so what I like to do when someone brings a support person into a meeting, I like to set the tone fairly early on. So you know, thank everyone for coming, explain what we're here for. Um, and then I will say, you know, John, I can see you've come along as a support person for Sue. Really appreciate you being here and, and you know, thank you for supporting Sue through this. Just so that we're clear, um, the role of a support person is not an active one in the meeting. So the conversation I'm going to have is with Sue uh, and, you know, I'm looking for Sue's responses to stuff. Um, your role is to be here as an emotional support or a um, moral support to Sue. 
I don't, you know, if if you think Sue needs a break or if you think Sue is forgetting something and you want to give a reminder, absolutely go for gold. Um, you know, keen for you to play that role, but you're just not here as a spokesperson for Sue. Um, just so we're all nice and clear at the start. And then I just see how it goes. If they become really obstructive, then we have to deal with that during the meeting. The second question we get asked a lot is how many warnings need to be issued before I can terminate employment. Now there is no hard and fast rule to this. Um, there used to be that old kind of three strikes and you're out sort of approach um, that fair work would apply. That's no longer in place. Fair work is clear that um, the employer can apply reason to the process that needs to be taken in the circumstances but you need to be able to prove that the approach you've taken is fair, reasonable and just. So for more minor things um, or things that are, uh, are less sort of significant, it may well be that you do end up with the three or four process before you terminate. For other things like, you know, serious misconduct, it may well be a show cause and they're out. It really does depend. And so we do, again, recommend that if you think it's heading down this track, that you get some advice from someone that you trust and knows this stuff. We also get asked, does an employee have to sign the performance management records? Um, because we know some companies have got, you know, the, the PIP and those sorts of things or formal warnings in their templates. They've got a space where the employee gets to sign stuff. The answer to do they have to sign it is no. It helps obviously because it, you know, it adds to the robustness of your process and your documentation, but they don't have to. Um, you can ask employees to sign meeting notes. You can ask them to sign any letters, but it's really important that they're clear that if they choose not to sign, it doesn't detract from the validity of it. In signing, you're simply asking them to, in a sense, um, accept responsibility, accountability, contribute to the solution, et cetera. Um, but it's not a must and it doesn't change it. And believe me, I have faced some of the most interesting conversations with people um, in my early days when I used to try to make it that people had to sign. Um, I had one very interesting situation with someone once who had been um, and admitted to it, fudging their timesheets. So putting down incorrect times. And when I did the formal warning up to say, don't do it again, um, I used the wording in there that was, um, I used the word dishonest, um, you know, so the formal warning for, was for being dishonest on your timesheets. Um, don't do it again. I wanted this person to sign it. And this person came back and said, no, I'm not signing it. I said, oh, why not? And they said, oh, I don't like the word dishonest. And I kind of went, that's, what, that's what's happened, right? And they're going, yes, but because of my, um, I think at the time it was religious beliefs, um, I, you know, honesty is one of the, the really important parts or principles of, around my beliefs. And so I'm not going to sign it because it says I'm dishonest. And I'm kind of going, but hang on a second. Was it true that you did that time? No. But did you write it down? Yes. So is that dishonesty? No. <laughs> so sometimes you can't get logic, which is why I have stopped trying to argue the, you know, whether or not they'll sign it. Are they happy with the wording? You can dig yourself into a real rabbit warren if you try to um, go down that track. So I'm a little bit more, um, not aloof, but, you know, a, a little bit more sort of um, firm around, right? You know, this is what it is. Um, so that covers a lot of the process for you. Um, I guess point I'd like to make, I really like this saying, what we allow will continue, what continues will escalate. This speaks to that point we made earlier around, have the little conversations, the alignment and clarity, the set the performance expectations during um, recruitment and then during probation and then in your performance appraisals and have those small touch base conversations, have those little things that mean that it doesn't escalate, that means that we don't end up at the pointy end of significant performance management, termination, et cetera. Having those small conversations early 
takes a bit of bravery, but when you do it and you do it well and you do it with the right intent, you are, I guarantee you, um, often shortcutting having to deal with the really serious stuff later down the line. Um, so really important to, to do that. Jess, are you covering the what's next to wrap it up? Um, yep. So um, as Naomi explained earlier, we have a performance management toolkit um, that's aimed to assist businesses and provide the tools to help navigate um, the performance management process. Um, included in this are guidelines for managers, template letters, um, conversation scripts, tips, checklists, etc. Uh, this usually costs $1,355. Um, but for anyone in attendance today, uh, we're providing a 10% discount um, on the kit. Just mention the web now when you contact us um, and we can organise to get that through to you. Uh, just note that this is only valid until the 28th of October. So if you'd like to take us up on that offer, um, please email info at Focus HR. Cool. Thanks, Jess. Yeah, Thanks. so everything we've gone through today is, is included in that plus a whole lot more. So um, that covers it and we are 11.32, so we're two minutes over time. But um, happy to stay online for a little bit longer if anyone has any questions that they want to ask us. Um, feel free to put in the chat or come off of mute and, um, and have a bit of a talk to us.